As many of you will know, our public lecture program, uh, or program course and courses, are devoted to introducing some of our most original scholars and their research to a broad audience. And I'm really delighted to introduce this term's series of lectures because they promise to do exactly this. We have some amazing speakers coming up over the next few weeks. And I can't wait to hear all of their ideas, evil images, and expressing and shaping Britain's relationship to the globe. Our stellar list of contributors has been assembled by the two conveners of the programme, Dr. Jessica Berenbaim and Dr. Lloyd De Beer. I was delighted when last year both Jessica and Lloyd agreed to jointly take on this role of convener. After we at the PMC had decided that we'd like to put on a course of talks on the medieval period. Jessica, who's a university lecturer in literature and visual culture at the University of Cambridge, and Lloyd, who, as so many of you will know, is a curator at the British Museum, were our first choices to convene the course, thanks to their own scholarly brilliance and to the fact, quite honestly, that they're so much fun to work with, as we've found out in the past and we're already finding out at the moment. They responded, both jo uh, Lloyd and Jessica responded to our invitation to develop the course and its themes and to choose its contributors with typical generosity, creativity, and enthusiasm. And tonight, over the next hour or so, Jessica and Lloyd themselves will introduce the five themes that they have used to structure their program and explain why these themes are so significant in medieval culture, as well as, our, as well as to our own understanding of the Middle Ages and the history of British art. After their talk, we'll have up to half an hour for questions, both from the audience gathered here, all of you here at the center, but also from those of you participating online. And for all those of you who are watching online, please could you enter your questions in the chat box. One of my colleagues here will then read them out to Jessica and Lloyd. And just to say, too, that closed captioning is available for online viewers, and that tonight's lecture will be recorded and made available on our website at a later date. Well, that's enough of me. Can I ask you all now to welcome Jessica and Lloyd to the lectern to introduce us to Britain and the world in the Middle Ages. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to have a sip of water before we start. Thank you, Mark, for an extremely kind introduction, and thank you so much for inviting Jessica and myself to co-convene this course, this series. So let's begin. On the 26th of September, 2021, a metal detectorist in Devon was searching on farmland near Hemyock, about 25 miles northeast of Exeter. There, he made a chance discovery. From the ground came a tiny gold coin measuring 2.3 centimeters in diameter and weighing just under three grams. Before its discovery, there were only seven other known examples and news of its unearthing and subsequent sale caused a stir. One side of the coin shows what is perhaps the most recognizable image of the Middle Ages, that of an enthroned king crowned with both feet placed on a footstool. In his right hand, he carries a scepter and in the other, he holds an orb symbols of his divine majesty. The reverse is divided into four sections by means of a central cross, each part decorated with a flower of five petals. Textual inscriptions tell us which king we are looking at, and in addition, remarkably, the name of the man responsible for minting. They are King Henry III of England and William of Gloucester, the king's goldsmith. We are therefore in the middle of the 13th century. The world inhabited by these two men was primarily that of Western Europe. The goldsmith William was born in Gloucester, later becoming a citizen of London, and although he acquired wealth and status, there is little indication that he ever left London, uh, England during his life. Henry, on the other hand, was born in Winchester. He held other titles in addition to being King of England, including that of Lord of Ireland and Duke of Aquitaine. His mother was French, and while he maintained correspondence with other similar influential figures across Europe, even traveling to the continent on occasion, he spent the greater part of his long reign in England. This gold coin, however, a piece of pocket change found in rural Devon, and possibly for some the kind of object you might quickly and easily walk past in a museum without taking much notice of, opens up for us a very different world far beyond these rather limited geographic parameters. In the middle of the 13th century, Henry began amassing gold to finance a crusade in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
documents from the king's own administration reveal the different types of gold that he was collecting, including foreign coins called Bezants from Byzantium and others called dinars minted in Mercia by the Omorovids, a North African Islamic dynasty who ruled over most of modern day Morocco and Southern Spain. Their gold was most likely brought across the Sahara from West Africa on caravans of camels. In the end, Henry's crusade never took place and part of his gold collection was turned into this gold coinage, the first produced in England for several hundred years. This little coin made from African gold takes us all the way from sub-Saharan Africa to the Byzantine Empire, from the Eastern Mediterranean back to England. When that lucky detectorist recovered the coin from the Devonshire soil, where it had probably laid undisturbed for 800 years, there is little chance he could have conceived of the journey it took to get there. So even this most diminutive of objects, with its conservative imagery, forces us to ask questions about the relationship between medieval Britain and the rest of the world. Once we start looking at objects and images in this way, it opens up a multitude of possibilities shifting our focus and changing the way we think about medieval art. <coughs> so Lloyd has given you a preview, really, um, of how far-reaching and yet how integrated these global connections are, that they've actually really literally seeped into the soil. So in this lecture, we hope as conveners to open up the themes of this course and to give you a context for the more in-depth discussions from the lectures over the next few weeks. Essentially, what we hope to give you a sense of this evening is why it's important and how it all fits together. So first of all, I'm going to take you through another work of medieval art, very different from this one. And that will allow me to introduce and in a sense to preview the five themes of the course as a whole. And equally important, I to generate discussion of several questions critical to the course. What do we mean by Britain in the world? What do we mean by image and reality? And why have we chosen this topic for a public lecture course? Why does it matter? So this is a page from a manuscript, so a handwritten and painted book, probably made in Ireland in the early 1300s. Like many medieval books, it includes texts of various kinds, and in this case, more various than most. History, poetry, fiction, science, self-help, wise sayings, geography, religious stories, prayers, and philosophy. And actually, that's not even all. That's really just the main ones. Uh, so in this book, also not uncommon for the period, uh, they're written in three languages, English, French, and Latin. And the writing you see just a snippet of on the left here uh, is the end of a text called, in fact, The Image of the World, which is then completed by, oops, sorry, let's do that, which is then completed by this picture here. So the painting here that you see right there is this manuscript's version of a particular medieval image of the universe imagined as a sequence of concentric spheres. So at the center is the earth, right? with a person digging and trees growing out of the soil, then the waters with different kinds of fish and sea creatures here, then the moon, right, okay, uh, then planets, then the sun, more planets, and then on the outside here, what's called the sphere of the fixed stars. Um, outside of this structure, moving it, but not moving with it, is the divine figure enthroned on a rainbow here, blessing with one hand and with the other holding an orb. So much like the earthly king that you saw on his coin, but this orb here is a little bit different. It's itself depicted to resemble a medieval map of the world, which connects it to the spheres governed below as a kind of visual echo. And you'll be hearing more about medieval maps and the visions of the world they express in Professor Hyatt's lecture on the 22nd. So here I'm going to show you a close-up of the center of that image here. So I chose this uh, painting for our introductory discussion because of the many ways that this picture and this manuscript can further open up the course's conversation about the medieval image of the world in both senses of the word image. That is, image both in the sense of picture and in the sense of idea. 
Works of art like this one were a powerful method of disseminating ideas about the world and the viewer's place in it. So here, indeed, humanity's place in the world is rather ambivalent. On the one hand, the human figure is at the center of the universe. On the other hand, humanity's perspective is inverted, disoriented. The upside down depicted person sees everything backward, although of course the real person, the reader of this book, so the person with the view that you have now, sees everything perfectly and sees the reality that the artist is able to express. So if the painting here depicts an image of the universe's structure and the relationships of its component parts, what about the realities of the actual medieval world? How was that structured and organized? What were the relationships of that globe's component parts? How was it imagined? And the theme of our course, what was Britain's place in it? So the manuscript here exemplifies some of those realities as well. A book written partially in an Irish dialect of English, partially in French, which was at that time spoken far beyond the borders of what's now France, and partially in Latin, spoken and read more widely still. The relationships both among the component parts of the British Isles, as well as between them and the rest of the medieval world, were extraordinarily strong, intimate, and complex, very complicated. So this brings me to the question of why this topic for a course about British medieval art. Well, uh, in even thinking about the concept of British medieval art, one hits a staggering roadblock before one even begins. That is to say that there is no such thing as British medieval art. There was no United Kingdom in the Middle Ages, and orienting research around art from places in what are now the modern nations of the United Kingdom and Ireland inevitably it becomes a sort of anachronistic and in some ways an, uh, an exercise that feels quite inorganic. Uh, so furthermore, the terminology is painfully fraught, as many of you I'm sure will be aware. So the phrase British Isles most obviously uh, subsumes Ireland's independence, but the term British, even when used very self-consciously, excluding Ireland, uh, is problematic as well in its own way. Now the reasons for this, so the sort of imperial implications of the term British, become powerfully clear in light of a distinctive strand of specifically medieval mythological art and literature, which is called, went by the name, the Matter of Britain. And myth is the subject of uh, Professor Bovey's lecture on the 14th, so you'll hear a lot more about that kind of uh, area of medieval kind of cultural history that has so much bearing really on these, this course as a whole. So many recent scholars have tried valiantly to popularize other terms for the British Isles um, with phrases like uh, Atlantic archipelago is one of the sort of more popular ones and other similar terms. But whatever their virtues, these terms just don't really seem to have caught on that much. Um, and we'll hear a broader view of how scholars have reimagined and represented the medieval world for public audiences in Professor Majid's lecture about museums on the 12th of May. Uh, but there's another very concrete reason why the phrase British medieval art fails to capture the reality of what it appears to describe. A great many works of art may have ended up elsewhere, or were made for people here but originated elsewhere, or were made here by people who themselves came from elsewhere, or were made elsewhere by people from here, or were made partially elsewhere and partially here. Um, and that doesn't even cover all the permutations, basically every combination you can imagine. And this is something that both Professor Nixon and Professor Leister will address um, these histories in their lectures, which are on respectively metamorphosis and the theme of movement. So the concept of medieval art simply essentially falls apart. It collapses uh, as soon as it collides with even the most basic outline of these realities. So it became clear that the theme of Britain and the world was a possible focus for our course when we realized that we couldn't think of these problems of, of, sort of, as it were, British medieval art, which are, after all, such an important part of the current national conversation, these problems as obstacles to the topic. They are the topic. The image and reality part of our course title is important. Although we do draw on the work of historians, literary historians, uh, scholars of all disciplines, really, ours is a course that addresses this theme specifically through the history of art. 
These are not just political and historical questions, but aesthetic and artistic ones. And what is more, art historical study has the distinctive potential to bring new understanding to them. So to that end, in the rest of our lecture, each of us will offer you two examples, so four works of art that engage with our course theme, but in varying ways. And before we begin to talk about those examples, I just want to say a few words about the, the purpose, so our purpose with these examples, what it is really that we aim to communicate with them. So the conventional wisdom that the Middle Ages was you know, provincial in the extreme, that most people never left the villages in which they were born, is not without an element of truth. Many people did never leave their villages, and medieval buildings that in our terms are very nearby one another can look very different because they're built out of different local stones. But as a total understanding of the medieval world, as it really was, this picture simply does not match the reality. Furthermore, and perhaps I would say actually even more significantly, it suggests this essential and really false opposition between local and global that has no basis in historical fact. The Middle Ages were both local and global. Some people never left their villages, others traveled farther than most people do today. A building made out of local stone could be furnished with works of art from around the world. A coin in someone's pocket could be made from gold mined 4,000 miles away. So, this understanding of a global Middle Ages is very much the current consensus in the scholarship. But for the art historians among us, it can often feel frustratingly unvisual. Uh, yes, we know the facts, but what does that mean for individual works of art? So that is what our examples are intended to illustrate. By no means do they cover everything, but through them, you can begin to develop a sense of how this understanding of the medieval world affects our understanding of its art. screen presents us with a courtyard scene. We are looking at a grand building made up of a thatched roof, columns, and a base level decorated with a raised design of various swirling patterns. Between the columns, mostly hidden in shadows, are several seated and standing figures. Four African men dressed in traditional toga-like kente cloths and a European here, shown carrying a staff and standing with one leg crossed over the other. The photograph was taken in 1887 and is currently held at the National Archive, but it originally comes from the collection of the British Colonial Office, catalogued as Views in Kumasi, Kwakadua and his Court. This description helps locate us in West Africa, in what is now modern-day Ghana, but was then the capital of the Asante Kingdom. It is not possible to say with any certainty exactly where in Kumasi the photograph was taken, but it might be the courtyard of a royal palace belonging to the ruler Prempe I. At the center of the ancient tree, its exposed root system rising out of the ground like a sinuous mound. Located to the immediate right of the tree, here, positioned on the mound itself are two remarkable medieval bronze jugs made not in West Africa, but in England in the late 14th century. I'll let that there. Ten years after the photograph were forcibly removed by British forces during the anglo ashanti War to this day and are currently housed in different British institutions. The larger of the two, which you can see there, the larger of the two, which measures around 63 centimeters, is in the British Museum. It was acquired in 1896 by Charles and Le from Charles and Leisure Barter, who served in the British Army during the Fourth Ashanti Expedition. It is an extraordinary object. Three circular layers of text in English around its bowl with various heraldic insignia. Uh, you can see these, uh, these kind of heraldic motifs all over it, including um, the arms of an English king, which are just here. Possibly Richard II, due to the appearance of a stag, his personal badge on the jug's lid. 
You might know Richard from his own appearance in the famous Wilton diptych on display at the National Gallery. An image of a stag is painted on the reverse of the diptych. So this jug, made in the 14th century, potentially for an English king, somehow made its way to Ghana to become a treasured item owned by a West African ruler. At 49 centimeters, the second Kumasi jug is smaller and plainer than the first, with few decorative embellishments, except for a shield below its spout added in the late 19th century. So you can see that there. This has an engraved inscription that reads, Bronze Urn presented to the officers, 2nd Battalion, Prince of Wales, West Yorkshire Regiment at Kumasi, 17th of January, 1896, by the governor of the Gold Coast. Today, this jug is in the possession of the York Army Museum, but on long-term loan to Leeds City Museum. When and by what means these jugs traveled to West Africa is unrecorded but it is possible that they made the journey as early as the 16th century, by which time direct trade connections between Western Europe and West Africa had been, had been established. This predates the formation of the Asante Kingdom, meaning that there were probably numerous other life cycles to these English-made medieval objects in Africa before they arrived in Kumasi. Dr. Tom Nixon will be exploring these themes, as Jessica has mentioned, in further detail. He'll be focusing on, on on the jug at the British Museum in his lecture on the 28th of April through this theme of method. Indeed, for these jugs, their place of origin might well have disappeared from view soon after they left England. Their African history is as integral to understanding them as is their English one. They should not be seen as separate, but intertwined. But their 19th century removal from Kamasi during a period of British colonial occupation and in one case, their subsequent, a subsequent acquisition by a British National Museum provokes us to think about how the geographic parameters of the Middle Ages have been constructed, especially in regards to the place of Africa in the broader narrative. English objects such as these jugs, as extraordinary as they are, found in unexpected places, are often written off as outliers, thinking we can't understand them. They, they sit outside of the way that we think. But what if we placed them at the center of how we sought to understand Britain's place in the wider medieval world? And what would that mean more broadly for the study of medieval art? These are not questions I aim to answer now, but ones we hope will linger throughout the lecture series. I'd like to move now from Kumasi to Rome, from Ghana to Italy. The images on screen show the facade and the nave of Santa Croce in Jerusalem, an ancient and important pilgrimage church in Rome, not far from the Basilica of St. John Lateran. Around the same time as the Kumasi bronze jugs were being produced, that being the late 14th century, a group of English sculptures were about to make their own remarkable journey from England to Italy. And here are the carvings here. St. Paul on the left and St. Peter on the right on display at Santa Croce, which has been their home for many centuries. Given their size and the remarkable skill of the sculptor responsible, the figures were almost certainly a bespoke commission. They are made out of alabaster, a beautiful gray-white translucent stone that became popular in Europe from the 14th century onwards. England was internationally renowned for the quality of its alabaster, which could be found in huge quantities in the English Midlands, particularly in Derbyshire and Staffordshire, and some of the earliest sculptors working in alabaster are connected with the Midlands region. Each carving stands around 115 centimeters in height, placing them among the largest freestanding English sculptures in alabaster. As we will see, the choice of St. Peter and St. Paul was meaningful for the Roman-based patron. Both saints were martyred in Rome, where their relics still remain. The figures are highly individualized. Paul is shown thinning and bald on top, with long wavy hair tucked tightly into the cloak worn around his shoulders. His beard is made up of a series of individual corkscrew curls with a spiral mustache resting on his upper lip. Traces of an orange-yellow pigment indicate that his hair was once brightly gilded. He has an aged and weathered face. The anxious creases carved into his forehead and around his eyes must once, like his hair, have been accentuated with pigment. This is true, too, of Paul's eyes, which now appear vacant, but were originally painted on. In his left hand, he holds an open book, positioned with delicate fingers, and in his right hand, he balances at his feet a large, broad-bladed sword. He 
He is dressed in secular clothing, shown wearing a wraparound cloak gathered up under his left arm, the drapery falling in a series of beautifully rendered folds. Remains elsewhere is hard to detect with the naked eye, but it was probably richly polychromed. The sculpture of Peter, on the other hand, has not fared as well as Paul. There is a major break across the neckline and his chin, nose, hair and headgear all show signs of damage. In contrast to Paul's secularity, Peter, Prince of the Apostles, is shown wearing the clothing of a bishop. He is beardless and his hair is short, shown as a series of individual twisted locks. On his head, he wears a special hat called a mitre, combined here with the papal tiara, a crown with the repeating design of large flowing leaves. Around his left arm hangs two keys, and in his left hand, he carries a model of a church, a reference to the fact that Christ makes Peter the rock on which the church is founded. So how did they get to Rome? In 1382, a papal tax collector called Cosmato Gentilis was granted a special license from King Richard II of England to transport three large alabasters of St. Peter, St. Paul, and the Virgin Mary from Southampton to Rome. This was the very same English king whose heraldic shield appears on the Kumasi bronze jug at the British Museum. The license was a coup for Gentilis. It exonerated him from paying any customs duties on the value of the sculptures. As tax collector, Gentilis was not simply a low-level lackey of the current Pope Urban VI. He was also papal chaplain, held a licentiate in canon law, and was papal nuncio in England. Thus, the king might well have wanted to curry favor with the Pope's trusted representative, a wise move as Gentilis went on to become Pope himself as Innocent VII. It is also likely that Richard might have known Gentilis personally. In a letter sent following his return to Rome, the king addressed him as beloved friend. At some point after returning to Italy, Gentilis presented the alabasters to Santa Croce, to which he was appointed cardinal priest in 1389. The expense of transportation, his retention of the carvings over several years, as well as his subsequent donation, all suggest that Gentilis was attached to these images, a reminder perhaps of his time in England, for which he seems to have retained an affinity. However, Gentilis' license only provides evidence for the movement of sculptures out of England. There are no clues as to who made them, or how, when, or why they were acquired. These questions remain open-ended. Why, of all the various different object types he encountered, did Gentilis choose to return with these alabasters? Did he commission them himself, or were they a gift? Gentilis' work collecting papal taxes took him across the country. We might think of this as his very own British Grand Tour, on which he likely encountered the work of English sculptors in alabaster. Where he went and what he might have seen remains conjectural, but perhaps he visited Gloucester Cathedral, then an abbey, with its alabaster tomb of Edward II located in the ambulatory at the East End. Or he might have made his way to St. George's Chapel, Windsor, and taken in the great alabaster reredos made by Peter the Mason of Nottingham that now no longer survives. At Durham Cathedral, did he see the newly built stone screen installed behind the high altar containing over 100 alabaster statues, including the Virgin flanked by St. Oswald and St. Cuthbert? He might even have seen the work of foreign sculptors in alabaster, such as the tomb of Philippa of Hainaut, made by Jean de Liège and installed next to the Confessor's Shrine at Westminster Abbey. Situating Gentilis' carvings alongside these other roughly contemporary sculptures helps locate them. His alabasters are not simply exported products, as they have been characterized in the past, but are among the best preserved English sculptures on the continent. No other 14th century document co so comprehensively connects a European patron with a group of surviving English sculptures as does Gentilis' license to export. But his case was surely not a one-off. Other fine medieval English sculptures located on the continent were probably originally exported in similar circumstances. The three sculptures you see on screen all made in alabaster in England around the same time as Gentilis' Roman carvings. And all of these ended up being taken abroad. The Virgin and Child on the left was previously in St. Truden, Belgium. The image of St. Catherine at the center is in Paderborn, Germany. And the sculpture of Doubting Thomas to the right is in Gdansk, Poland. The story of their journeys, or the stories of their journeys abroad, are, like the Kamasi bronze jugs, much harder to recreate with the same level of historical detail that we can bring to the figures of Peter and Paul in Rome. These other sculptures have also been treated essentially as outliers. 
To continue in this way is to ignore the fact that England's artistic, as well as mercantile and political connections in the Middle Ages, were truly expansive, in this case, taking us all the way from the alabaster quarries in the Midlands to the Low Countries in Germany, all the way across the Baltic coast and down the Adriatic Sea. So, my first example is a memorial image for someone called John Broadwell. So it's made of brass. Uh, what I'm showing you here is not brass itself. It's what's called a brass weapon. So that is an impression on paper. As these kinds of very low-relief metal sculptures are notoriously difficult to photograph, it's the best way of grasping their design as opposed to their materiality. And even if it makes them look a bit like print, so you have to keep that in mind. This is rubbing effect of the art prints made using the brass of a, of a kind of printing matrix. Uh, and you'll see a, a picture in a moment of the, of the brass itself, so you can get a sense of what that looks like. So, but I'll use this image to talk to you a little bit about the design uh, and as well as of the images as well as the text. So, the inscription around the outside has the details of his name, John Blodwell, the fact that he was blind, and the date of his death on the 16th of April, 1462, when he was probably in his 80s. So medieval people sometimes did live a long time. Another <laughs> piece of conventional wisdom that's not entirely true. Uh, in the center is a figure of Blodwell himself, see here, um, with his hands clasped. He's wearing an extremely elaborate robe so that's all those details are what you see there. Um, and uh, he's depicted under an architectural canopy. And one of the you know, particularly wonderful aspects of many objects from this period is their immense enthusiasm for depicting other works of art in other media sort of within themselves. So what sort of seems probably to be represented here within this piece of metalwork are embroidery, so this kind of embroidered ro robe. Uh, Microarchitecture, miniature architecture, architectural sculpture, and in the elaborate clasp to the robe, other pieces of metalwork. The figures standing in the architectural niches here, so you see there are figures there, there, and there, and there, are uh, images of saints. Uh, so you see John the Baptist, John the Evangelist, the apostles Peter and Andrew, the bishops Asaph and Nicholas, and uh, Saints Bridget and Winifred. Um, there are also figures depicted, or rather sort of depicted as embroidered here. And you see there's standing figures here all down this robe. Um, and these are archangels, Michael and Gabriel, Saints David and John of Beverly, Thomas of Hereford and Chad, and Catherine and Margaret. So the details of particularly which saint actually are important because um, as I said, this image in metal depicts images of people in stone and fabric and Blodwell himself, an actual human being. Um, these other figures are an, sort of an interesting mix of those who were venerated by Christians in many parts of the world at that time, Europe, a Asia, and Africa. Um, and it combines those with uh, some holy figures whose cults were more particular to the British Isles. And finally, um, there's a significant delegation of holy figures who are special to Wales. So that's Asaph, Winifred, and David. And so the reason for this becomes clear in light of the inscription below, so this text here. Um, and this is very unusual inscription in terms of both its text and its artistic technique. And what I'm going to show you next is a photograph of the brass itself of this detail here. There you go. Okay. So, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what this says and sort of how it, how it kind of bears on the theme. So the inscription here has the text of a kind of dramatic dialogue. It's sort of, um, it's almost like a kind of play script, a dialogue of two voices, which begins with John Blodwell himself speaking directly. So that's this text here. And what he's saying is, Wales gave birth to me, Bologna taught me law, Rome gave me experience, and five nations gave me their languages. So what he means by this is that he was born in Wales, he studied in Bologna, he was a student, law student there, he worked in Rome, and he spoke five languages. And three of them would have been Welsh, English, and Italian. I, almost certainly another one of them would have been French. Um, and he would have known Latin as well, but I suppose I think he probably means another modern language, but uh, it's not, not entirely known. Um, so these are the words depicted in sculpt sculptural relief, so raised lettering in the first two lines. In the third line, 
another voice breaks in and another technique. Um, so it's incised, so the, uh, the ground is raised and the lettering is incised, so there's another voice breaks in and also how it's actually done changes as well. It's really interesting. So this other voice chastises Blodwell for showing off about languages, experience, his law degree, uh, and reminds him that mortal life is brief and that the gifts of that life, not only money but also reputation, are ultimately empty. So the brevity and vanity of life on earth, uh, this is a perennial theme in medieval English poetry and art, um, but this poem is distinctive in a number of ways. Like other poetry of its genre, it calls attention to the geography of the earthly and heavenly realms and the subject's trajectory in life from one to the other. But just as much, if not more so, it calls attention to the geography of the earthly realm itself, within itself, and this person's journey through that world, Wales, Bologna, Rome, and finally England, where this is located. In the allusions to Blodwell's professional reputation, there are echoes of other places as well where he traveled, and this is known from, from record sources, archival sources. Uh, so he traveled to a number of other places in the course of a very successful academic, legal, and diplomatic career. He spent time in what's now Germany and Spain, and almost certainly in other places as well. So strikingly, the opening words, Wales gave birth to me, are also a direct and very recognizable literary reference to what's called the Virgilian epitaph. Uh, the Virgilian epitaph, so this is the traditional epitaph um, a, attributed conventionally to the ancient Roman poet Virgil, begins in much the same way, but with different places. Mantua gave birth to me and Calabria took me away. And so the text of this memorial also signals its subject's membership in what we would now call an international intellectual community. So my second example, like Lloyd's first one, uh, also begins in the Colonial Office Archive and the National Archives in Kew. So the image here is from an early photograph in one of the Colonial Office uh, photography record series, uh, and it's an image of Belipes Abbey, which is near Kyrenia in the north of Cyprus. Now, Cyprus is a place usually associated with Britain's modern global empire, but in fact, medieval British Isles and medieval Cyprus have long-standing connections, human, political, and artistic, that go back actually much farther. So for example, King Richard I of England conquered Cyprus, which had strategic potential in the context of medieval, that is to say crusading, as well as modern imperial and colonial activity. So he was married in Limassol, and his conquest of Cyprus, he captured a battle standard that he then gave to the great abbey of Burris and Edmonds in Suffolk. So material collection, connection there. Um, there were other ongoing artistic connections as well between medieval Britain and Cyprus, and some of these involved the exchange of design ideas, as well as, in the case of the battle standard, um, actual objects. So there were sort of ideas, visual culture, images, as well as actual material culture going between the two places. Um, some of these design comparisons have long been noted, but many substantial connections are really only recently beginning to be discovered. So very exciting research that scholars are doing in this area. Um, for example, in the cloister of the Abbey of Belipes, which you saw in the image from the colonial office record in the last slide, um, and I'm showing it to you now just in a more recent uh, photograph, <clears throat> so Belipes was an abbey of Premonstratensian, what are called Premonstratensian canons. That is to say, um, these are priests living together in a convict community, so, so sort of like monks, um, essentially like monks for all intents and purposes here. Uh, their cloister here was constructed in the mid-14th century, and you can see over here the remains of stonework beneath the arches, which seems to have been added somewhat later, say in the third quarter of the 14th century. So sadly, as you can see, a lot of it's gone, but there is enough that remains to get a sense of what was once there. So these kinds of stone decorations, tracery patterns, are often highly intricate and very distinctive, um, almost like fingerprint, you could think of it sort of that way. The tracery designs here, so it's recently been noted, been worked out, that they correspond particularly closely to English models. And the most likely explanation is that artists from England worked here in creating the stonework 
for Belipes. So our final image has, uh, or our final example, has brought us back full circle to the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the catalyst for Henry's project to amass African gold to mint this coin that ended up in the ground in Devon. Uh, and in conclusion, we would like to end with this object where we began as a kind of emblem of how much of the world can be, as it were, densely concentrated, you know, like profoundly kind of packed into even a very small medieval object. What we hope our introduction here uh, has shown are some of the ways to kind of expand that. So it's concentrated in these objects and what we hope we've done is kind of expand it outward again in opening up these individual works for interpretation and in turn to bring those interpretations to bear on our own understanding of the medieval world. Maybe we should leave this, maybe we should leave our, our coin up, yeah. So I think mm -hmm. uh, if I can ask you to both stay at the left oh, yes, the so yeah. the uh, viewers can, can see. And um, so the first thing to do is to invite uh, members of the audience here at the PMC to ask any questions you'd like of uh, Lloyd and Jessica. And then we'll also have the opportunity to, uh, to relay questions that we might be getting uh, online as well. And for all of you who've been watching online, please submit questions. Uh, we'll certainly relay them uh, to Lloyd and Jessica. And we'd really like to welcome you to however open mm -hmm. and uh, open-ended those questions are, they'd be very appropriate for the beginning of a course like this one. But first of all, I want to say a huge thanks to you both for opening up what looks mm -hmm. like, sounds like a really rich program. And, and really, I mean, a, a question to ask you with to begin mm -hmm. with is, is the kind of work that you're doing uh, in this course and that you're obviously pursuing in your own research, does it offer quite a challenge to the ways in which the, his, the, the, the art history of medieval Britain has tended to be, has been done over the last decades? Or is it, or is it, is it part of a much broader and longer development, you see, in, in the discipline? I mean, it's a very interesting question because I think do, do objects like the jug at the British Museum bend to art historical methods. Yeah. And, and often, as Jessica alluded to, with this sense of how the global turn in, in, well, in all of art history really sometimes feels unvisual because what is it exactly that's at the core of it? How do you interpret these objects? And sometimes you end up doing a straying into a history of trade or straying into areas where, say, the way that you've trained as an art historian are difficult to, to match with the objects that you'd like to bring in into your, into your field of study. So mm. um, it's a challenge, but I think that, and we'll see the other lectures in this mm. series, how they respond art historically. So that's something we all mm. talked about very much at the beginning, you know, mm. that's, that centering art history in this is, was something that was really important. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that, I suppose, is that I feel like in a sense, it has an element of a return to very early practices in the field of, you know, the ways in which antiquaries were in some ways very kind of passive and open to their sources and they just kind of, if it was there, it was there, um, as opposed to kind of creating hierarchies of, uh, you know, certain types of uh, works are at the top either because of their medium or because they fit a perceived norm or that they seemed at the center, the, as we might now think of it, the constructed center rather than the periphery of art historical studies. So in a sense, it's, it's a, a deconstruction of hierarchies of medium and of geography that not in all ways, but in some ways is in tune with some very early ways mm. of studying the history of these, these objects. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so um, I think we have uh, Nerman here who can... I have a question from online from Rod Robert Gifford, who was wondering if the exchange of objects was two-way. I think he's referring specifically to the jugs that you mentioned, Lloyd, and if mm. they had arrived yeah, perhaps from the slave trade. That's a fascinating question yeah. because, I mean, the, answer, the, the simple answer is yes, but um, what predates the jugs' production in England and their ultimate movement to, to West Africa is the fact that in Western Europe, um, rulers, uh, the elite, were desperate to get hold of materials that came from sub-Saharan Africa, um, thinking obviously of gold and ivory as the main materials, but 
also uh, animals. Uh, there, were, there was an elephant in London in the 13th century, as many of you know from Matthew Paris's drawing. Um, that could have also come from Asia. Um, and there, there are ostriches. I mean, the Prince of Wales, we know the two-pence piece in our, in, in our pocket has ostrich feathers on it. Then that was adopted by the Black Prince, the son of Edward III in 1344. So you start to see that these, these things that we somehow take for granted are actually connected somehow much in a much larger way. But what I should say is that this, this desire for West African materials or, or rare uh, luxury materials wasn't about taking from Africa. You know, in a sense, the great trade network that existed in the Middle Ages was really between West Africa, North Africa, and the Islamic East. And Europe was desperate to kind of get in on the game. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the West African kingdoms were the major players. Uh, many of you will know the story of Mansa Musa, the emperor of Mali, who, who was so wealthy uh, that when he went, on, went to Mecca, he, he shifted the entire price of gold in Egypt because he gave away so much gold on his journey. Um, and, and he's depicted on European maps. You find Mansa Musa depicted. So to what extent can these objects also help us think about the perception of uh, West Africa, North Africa, the Islamic East through thinking about thinking about that point through these objects. Great. Any questions from the floor here that uh, you would like to pose to Lloyd and Jessica uh, in relation to their into their question? We have, we have or we also have more from online, but just maybe to focus here in the centre. Any questions that you'd like to ask at this stage? Yes. Um, I don't think it's a content well, list, it's image attributions. So those are the, the photo sources, um, national archives, photos we took ourselves, mix, mixes and things, so the sources for the, uh, for the photographs. Thank you. Not a very exciting slide, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, are you writing something down? Yes. You can feel free also to ask us if you want um, to know something detailed about an image, what happened. Yeah. I actually have a question about an image. Oh, yeah. Um, Carol Martin is asking, what was the sepia color image that was shown early in the presentation when Jessica was speaking about the false opposition of global and local? Ah, yes. OK. So this, um, I, let me just make sure this is the one you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, so that so. is a much enlarged detail of this, uh, our sort of mascot image. Uh, which is a, a map called, the, it's normally goes by the name of the Hereford World Map. So it's a, a large map which is in Hereford Cathedral, um, which is one of the sort of uh, most kind of thrilling uh, medieval objects and one of the most famous, at least among medievalists, uh, maps from the medieval period. I, and I've, I'm not sure, is, is Alfred Hayek going to speak about this? I don't know if he'll speak about this one in particular, but he will uh, speak a lot about kind of uh, these kinds of certainly images and uh, the role of the kind of um, the role of geographical literature and art in kind of constructing a world picture. Can I ask a question about those to you, Lloyd, about those two jugs in mm. the in that photograph? Mm -hmm. uh, in in their in, in terms of their place, this yeah, thank you. Mm. In terms of their placing here, I mean, I was just really struck by their juxtaposition with the roots of this tree, and what you make of that amazing kind of relationship that seems that's suggested there about whether that is an important place for these jugs to be placed, or is it a, a, a kind of a rather accidental uh, place in which they might have been? It'd be great if you could tell us a bit more about this astonishing kind of visual conjunction of these roots and that tree and these two jugs and what you might make of it. I mean, here, uh, the, uh, this is not my work as such. It's, it's Raymond Silverman, who uh, w worked on the importation of luxury metalwork into West Africa in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries as, as part of a PhD in the 1980s. And he's recently republished uh, some of this recently, or, or done more work on it. Um, and what he did is, so let's say, for instance, these English objects have always been seen as kind of, what are these things, and why, why did they get to Africa? And what he looked at is there's quite a lot of very high-end metalwork in West Africa, mainly imported Islamic metalwork, Mamluk, copper basins, often with textual inscriptions on them. And so you think about the Asante jug at the British Museum with that great big textual inscription on it. And, and this is obviously these copper objects, 
have moved to a, a culture that values bronze casting. So the, the sophistication of these objects, I think, is highly recognized by the people for, who cared for them. Mm. Throughout the centuries after they arrived in Africa, copper is not as widely accessible in West Africa as it is in Europe. So that's the other move of materials, copper, salt going mm -hmm. south, gold, ivory, and textiles going south as well. What Raymond worked on was to see that a lot of these objects are found in high status environments. So courtyards, um, in connection with um, certain rituals of pouring libations into the, into the vessels. And so here next to this tree, which is clearly a very old tree, in the center of a very highly decorated courtyard, means that there's some relationship between the objects, the tree, and ritual that is now um, slightly lost, at least to us looking at this photograph. But what Raymond did is looked at some of the, um, the memories of the associations of how these kinds of metalwork objects came to West Africa. And often they have these incredible stories attached to them and how they appeared out of nowhere and all kinds of uh, things that from an anthropological point of view are really fascinating. But so I think it's, it's, there's no accident here Mm. The placement, the location, the, yeah. the material, the object, all tied together to, to reveal this multi-layered mm. uh, history of these, of these objects and their, and their place here. Yeah. Can I actually just add something about the, um, you know, the image, the colonial and the colonial office photographs mm. in general? We've both, um, we've both used them in a sense by coincidence, but both of us are very interested in this, in this record series, um, which is of course not medieval, but um, it is a sort of a fascinating archive or p piece of an archive within the National Archives from the point of view of a medievalist because uh, you know, even if you've never seen the images before, uh, you have a sense of what's behind some of the ways, some of the image of them or the sense of them that has kind of come down to us culturally in the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, so it's been very kind of eye-opening, I think, from a medieval point of view. I don't want to speak for both mm -hmm. of us, but um, you know, to um, to look through these series and kind of think about how they, I mean, how they present all kinds of things, but in particular the kinds of objects that we kind of look at as medievalists. Okay. Yeah. You can lose many hours oh. because <laughs> yeah. they, the the National Archives have digitized and put them all on Flickr. And you can lose hours going through no. the, the Flickr folders. Not lose, spend productively spend many productively hours. Many, many yeah. hours of your, <laughs> of your yeah. day. Yeah. Is there a question, that, did you, a question that there in the corner? If you just wait for your microphone. Oh, yes, just very simple observation, probably incorrect. But in the very first image, it looks upside down. Could we the, return? The coin? Yeah, uh, that, uh, wait, where we see, yes, you see the man in the middle. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that upside down? Yes, yeah, yeah. So you see, it's, it's a little bit easier so you can see here the, the whole page. So uh, this, this sort of human figure is depicted you know, it, in, the, the, in the earth here. Um, and then the figure is depicted, so the divine figure uh, oh, is depicted kind of oriented right side up. And then the human figure is depicted uh, central but kind of ups, upside down and in, in reverse. Um, and that, I think that's sort of, uh, you know, um, the, in this image as a whole, you'll, you will and you may well have seen uh, versions of this other places, but uh, it's one of the things that makes it you know, particularly interesting, I would say. Uh, on one leg? No, he's Not got exactly. Two. He's got two. Okay, so what, it, it's a little bit hard to see, but here's one foot, and then here's a shovel, or, ah, yes. and then the other Thank foot you. is pressing down on it to push it into it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. No problem. No problem. Mm. Well, I, I mean, I suppose it's, um, as I say, I mean, religious or philosophical, really. I mean, I think I, the, so just in kind of co cosmological terms, this image of sort of, uh, of the universe or of the world I, is a sort of picture of the, the sort of order of things which is governed, ex you know, externally by what's called the prime mover, so the divine figure who kind of uh, causes everything, the first cause, who causes everything to happen, uh, and that uh, the sort of, um, I, I suppose you could call it philosophical or religious, but it's a conception of not just people's place in the world, but the place of everything, each thing relative to each other, uh, and 
the sort of reasons why things happen the way they do. So it's sort of a picture of not only the interrelationship of parts, but the interrelationship of actions and the sort of the source of the source of meaning and the source of things happening in the universe. If that makes sense. It's quite abstract, but Nevin, can you just take your mask down? For Hi, uh, yes, so a question from Simran Verdi. Um, is the modesty almost required in a medieval, sorry, is the modest, modesty almost required in medieval art due to the need to enforce the divine hierarchy of the medieval world, God, then kings, then all underneath them? Might this stem from the church desiring to maintain power? If all of your talents are given to you by God and are fleeting, then surely you must remain modest, lest you be punished and thus are controllable. <laughs> Referring to this one, <laughs> yeah. So I suppose uh, the the sort of um, that the respect in which this text and is conventional as opposed to the way in which it's unusual is on this sort of emphasis on the kind of fleeting and momentary nature of human life, uh, and the way in which uh, you know it's uh, it's sort of but but you know but a moment in the context of the world. And to remember that everything that you you know see or have in life is only temporary and is only empty. Um, and there may be things about this poem absolutely that are distinctive, and I did uh, and I did sort of mention a few of those. But there are some things that you will find in many places, and that were, if not everywhere, then one of the kind of really central, uh, you know, themes. If you want to, you could call it religious, you could call it philosophical. Um, central parts of the way in which at least some aspects of the society saw you know, their place in the world, but also their place in time and their, uh, the, the sort of role of the benefits of earthly life. I mean, there's also a sense that these, these types of objects, if you wanted to put them in a category, they of, often speak to you and they often try and get your attention. So often with, with brasses or, or, or funeral monuments in general, are kind of, hey, look at me. Mm -hmm. And they speak to you and they often say things like, you know, I was, I was so great in life and I had palaces and I had all this money, <laughs> but now I'm just rotting flesh in the yeah, ground yeah. Uh, and I'm nothing, you yeah. know? And so here there's a sense of this guy kind of bragging, you know, yeah. I do all this stuff. And then it's like, hang on, wait a minute, remember, uh, you're nothing. But of course, know? there's incredible irony too, because it's a very expensive monument. Exactly. You know? and, the, and there's, there's this sort of profound irony of, of you know, of these uh, epitaphs talking about how er earthly life is fleeting and you know these material things mean nothing in gold. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I want something that says money means nothing and I want it in gold. Like that's what I mean. <laughs> no, 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 Christina. Thank you. Um, actually, on that note, do you know if this would have been commissioned um, when he was still alive or was it something that somebody else did for him after he died? So I would say almost certainly while he was still alive it would have been something that he commissioned. There are some examples of the latter. Uh, so for example, uh, there are some things like this that are made you know, quite a long time after the person has died, presumably by family members or heirs, but this one was almost certainly commissioned and designed uh, during his lifetime. Yeah. Yes, a question here, Nevin. Um, thank you. Could you just run through again what the what the themes are that are coming up? I can mm. remember myths and maps, but mm -hmm. I've forgotten the others. Myths, maps, metamorphosis, movement, museums. The five M's. Five M's. <laughs> I know. And that was actually completely not intentional. It just happened. We really Medieval mi it. alliteration. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great, we have another question from uh, an online viewer. Uh, yes, an anonymous attendee asked, is there any particular reason places are depicted in miniature, like in the church being held in the alabaster mm -hmm. and the small orb echoing the bigger diagram of the world? Ooh, very interesting question. Well, I guess on a practical note, he couldn't hold a very big church. <laughs> so uh, um, do you want to take the globe one? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, no, it's, it's actually... Um, uh, it's actually not as sort of uh, straightforward a question to answer as it might seem because uh, it sort of gets at the medieval way of depicting things and the way of representing things. So um, it's in some ways quite straightforward to say what is depicted, a person holding a miniature building, but to explain why would have to sort of take in one of the ways in which medieval kind, kind of representing works as a kind of mode of you know, visual expression. Uh, and I suppose if I had to kind of characterize it, I would say 
that it's, um, although there can be elements of it that are mimetics, and in some cases very much so, like on these, I mean, these wonderful sculptures with sort of, you know, wrinkles under the people's eyes, you, you know, the hairs, the way in which the drapery folds fall, you know, they have a kind of sometimes very strongly mimetic quality, but in other ways, their mode of representation is extraordinarily symbolic and abstract. And I, you, you will often see, say, a donors of a church, the people who were the benefactors who gave money for a church to be built, um, or an abbey, holding the building and, you know, and sort of handing it over. I, and in a sense, yes, you have the person depicted and you have the building depicted, but the relationship between them is being depicted in a way that is highly abstract and symbolic. And the relationship among the objects depicted is not one that's visual, it's one that's conceptual. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that a papal crown or Peter uh, as the Bishop of Rome? I think it's both at the same time. So he's, mm -hmm. he appears as Bishop of Rome, but he's got the papal tiara, which sometimes is represented as a triple decker crown. Yeah, but in this case not, yeah. Can, I mean, I think that for us watching and listening to your talk, I mean, uh, you must think, wow, this is an astonishing way of doing your work, but it's incredibly challenging in the sense that you're, you're, being out, you're looking at objects that have traveled, you're engaging with cultures that are far flung, that are no doubt uh, often very new to you in terms mm. of doing research on. Um, and I just wondered whether the kind of work that you're both doing and that this, this uh, course is suggesting is it will both on the one hand require an amazing amount of collaboration between scholars I mean the mm. global turn not only mm. in relation to the subject matter and the way mm. of doing things but also in the ways you're all working collaborating with scholars from around the globe to make this kind of work happen and I'd also be really interested you mentioned uh, uh, the Flickr mm -hmm. archive mm -hmm. of, um, of the Colonial Office for Photographs, whether the digital is really allowing this kind of work in a way that may not have been the case 50 years ago, whether that sheer abundance of newly reproduced and available imagery mm. is helping you do the kind of global work, as it were, that you're able to do now. And maybe in the way that yeah. these kinds of talks can also be accessed by people yeah. mm. in lots of different places. I mean, I think there is a problem with lots of research and funded research and the outputs remaining in Western Europe or, or North America. And so there is a problem about how you meaningfully engage globally through the kinds of research that, that you want to do. Um, yes, I think the, the digital and I think access to images and that kind of thing have a huge part to play. But just taking one, one step back yeah. from your question about the kinds of objects and difficulties, I mean, one thing if you're a medievalist looking at the kinds of objects we've selected, we've actually selected some of the most kind of nerdy <laughs> of all medieval objects, brasses, coins, alabaster sculptures. I mean, the bronze jugs kind of sit outside a, a little bit, but you know, we haven't got kind of fantastic painting. You know, the kinds of object types we're looking at here are kind of nerdy. You know, you, the idea of a brass rubbing, you know, yeah. is, is the kind of thing that people do you know, there's a whole society dedicated to it, basically. So there's something interesting, I think, also, I don't have a massive point to make with that, but just our choices, yeah. and we've remarked on this, of what we've selected to talk about. Mm. Yeah, we haven't gone for the, like, super bling stuff, particularly. Mm. Um, and I, I think, I suppose part of the reason for that is that uh, you know, the, the objects we've chosen, we wanted a sort of range of things that it engaged with the, the questions in different ways. Um, and also, the sorts of things that we could really kind of, people might not normally see in books, mm. um, some of them are in books, but not, not all of them, but also where we could really kind of um, take everybody kind of into it by stages with us. Uh, and I think that, that mm. sort of governed a little bit those choices. And as far as the way in which sort of technology kind of enables that is that, you know, very good, um, very good digital photography makes it easier to talk about those mm. details. Uh, and that, that kind of makes a big difference. I think this sort of ideal way of conducting the research kind of in sort of logistical terms in terms of those challenges is sort of, I mean, I think of it as almost toggling back and forth between, you know, the materiality of it and the visuality of it. And the materiality that requires, you know, being present and actually kind of walking around the cloister and seeing how it mm -hmm. all fits together 
or you know, sort of looking at the you know looking at the you know the material of the alabaster and seeing like what, like what is it actually like? How does it respond to light? Um, and also being able to see the kind of volume of images that digitization allows one to do to grasp kind of broader patterns in terms of design. Yeah. 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 Obviously, one, one problem I think with digitization mm -hmm. is, you know, we've looked at these colonial office mm -hmm. photographs, but we haven't held the photographs. Mm -hmm. and. The, the notes written in pencil on the back mm. of these things. I've seen or some. I've seen the Cypress ones. I haven't thing, seen yeah. the. I haven't seen the. the um, I, I haven't seen the ones that you showed. But mm. I have seen. I've seen the Cypress ones. Um, actually, the interesting thing about them is they're sort of now um, in albums, and they do have kind of handwritten notes on them. And it's quite. It is quite interesting to see mm -hmm. what they say because then you have you've kind of plunged into the material world of the kind of nineteenth and, and in some cases very early twentieth centuries. And uh, it's like it's quite a different one. You and it, it's impossible to kind of look through the image to the object. You mm -hmm. very, like you feel very much, you know, there with the photograph. But I haven't seen the ones that you showed. So you know, I've seen them more in books. So mm -hmm. I connect them much more with the objects they mm -hmm. represent than with their archive mm -hmm. context. Yeah. Right. We might have questions. One. I think we might have time for one or two more questions before we wrap up. So Norman, over Perfect. to you again. Oh. It's, it's not a question. It's really a comment. Yeah. If you don't ask Doubting Peter, uh, I mean Doubting Thomas, mm. it's amazing for the color. Mm. That's, yeah. um, and it's interesting the way the, the hair is, is that yellow. Um, and there are t traces of it that are very much like the um, St. Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's. Um, mm. In the beard of the, the Thomas mm. and the hair of the Thomas. Yeah, I mean. It's uh, really you know, these, amazing. This sculpture, this. this one in Gdansk and two others mm. there were in the porch of St. Mary's Church in Gdansk, which, if, if you know it, is the, one of the most important churches in the Baltic. Yeah, and these English sculptures were in the porch there. Oh, yes. And they say, no one knows about these sculptures. No one knows about any of these sculptures. You know, they really, they do not feature at all. No. And uh, there's a resident English merchant population in Gdansk from the mid 14th century. There's all these interesting connections. Okay. Um, but yeah, the surviving polygamy, because often the ones in England and, uh, don't survive, they're smashed to pieces, most of them, where but they don't they, survive. Where is it now? It's in, in the, the church? National Museum in Gdansk. Oh, in the museum. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And these are one of the things you're recovering, a kind of a movement of objects and goods and artists mm. from England mm. across global networks in a way that maybe we're not used to? Or? Yeah, I think this kind of granular mm. Mm. mapping is, is something that people... Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the audience think. I mean, what do you, what do you think about when you think about British or mm -hmm. English or Welsh or Scottish or I mm. Irish medieval art? What comes to mind? I mean, you know, I think the prevailing view and what we hint hint at in our uh, text on on the website is is about perceptions of insularity mm. Mm. and separateness, and that's mm. obviously motivated by well, contemporary feelings mm. about uh, mm. the UK's relationship to to the rest of Europe. But, you know, that's not a problem in the Middle Ages. It's a very different world. You know, that coin of Henry III, mm. you know, his father, John, held territory in empire almost, mm. stretching mm. from the, the Scottish borders down to the Pyrenees. Mm. Mm. That was a very different concept of, of England, at least, relationship to, yeah. to the world. Yeah. Well, maybe one last question, Nevin, thank you. Question: uh, Anna Kennedy asks, "Do you subscribe to the view that the Renaissance wasn't a radical move forward from the Dark Ages?" That's in quotes. Uh, I know some scholars have argued that there shouldn't be a scholarly break at the beginning of the early modern period. Ooh, that is Big a question, wonderful yeah. question. Yeah. And of course, I did realize as I was speaking that we discussed the implications of everything: image, reality, Britain, world. And of course, we didn't talk about medieval, the Middle Ages. That's the one term that we sort of couldn't deconstruct everything in one talk. Um, so I suppose I, it's very hard to give a brief answer to that question. Um, I certainly would question uh, the idea of you know, a sort of radical and total break at a particular time, as I think probably most people would. Um, the way I prefer to think of medieval and renaissance is not as time periods, as chronological periods that, you know, where there's a, an end on a certain you know, day or a certain year or a certain even decade but more as cultures, that, re that, that Renaissance is a kind of, a, is a sort of cultural movement and ca that could coexist with medieval culture, what we think of as medieval <coughs> culture, rather than being a, a chronological epoch. Um, 
that is just about the shortest answer I can give to that question, but I could absolutely talk about it for hours. So um, I will turn no, no, it that's, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it over yeah. I think yeah. I think we might end there, but just yeah. to say that um, I once was given, I had to, an opera, a, a medical procedure which required general anesthetic, <laughs> and the anesthetists um, realizing that I was an art historian, as we were walking to the operations th uh, theater, just having put in the, uh, <laughs> the anesthetic said, so what is the difference between the medieval and the renaissance? <laughs> and I started talking, and then I instantly went, I just, <laughs> So that, that's what, that instantly <laughs> brought me, took me back to... Uh, to Enough to knock anybody out. Yeah, that knocked me out. Yeah. Right, thanks so much to both of you for an amazing introduction. I can't, I mean, I'm so excited about the rest of this talk, a uh, series of talks, and I really hope all of you will come back and follow this program. It's a really exciting one. All of you have been watching online. Um, we really look forward to welcoming you back on a weekly basis mm -hmm. as this uh, course unfolds, and uh, we'll be getting ever more richer layers of, uh, of interpretation and commentary on this topic. So many thanks to you both. Really looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the course. And for those of you here at the PMC, I can now welcome you to a reception that we're going to be hosting uh, downstairs. Thanks to everyone involved. Thanks especially to Nermin Abdullah, our, uh, the person who's in charge of our public lecture program and our learning program in, in so many ways, to Sriya Chatterjee's, uh, also part of the team here, and to everyone else, including Bryony, uh, Botwright Rance has helped out tonight. But thanks, everyone, and see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you.